بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. So alhamdulillah welcome to the last part of today's conference. Before we begin, something which I mentioned in the introduction, but I'll mention it again inshallah. That alhamdulillah, uh, this conference, Legends of the Ummah, is taking place in this masjid, Muhammadi Masjid. And for those that may not know, the Muhammadi Masjid was actually the first purpose-built Ahl Hadith Masjid in the UK. And it was built in or founded in 1976. And initially it was, you know, behind these doors, we have a f couple of classrooms. Initially that was a house, and that was a masjid. And then our elders, you know, may Allah have mercy upon those who have passed away and preserved those who are still alive. They went through a lot of effort, a lot of hard work, and alhamdulillah, uh, this new extension, new part of the masjid was built. And, uh, you know, we ask Allah Ta'ala to reward them for all their hard work. Because after the permission of Allah, without them, we wouldn't be here um, today. And Alhamdulillah, since then we've been extending the masjid a lot more. You've seen the new extension of the wudu area, especially on the brother's side. At the moment, that's only on the brother's side. But one of our next projects is to have something similar for the sisters as well, um, inshallah. So this is just a brief you know, summary or history of, of, of the masjid. And Alhamdulillah, we've had this conference, Legends of the Ummah. And you've heard each of the speakers speak uh, individually regarding their topics. And Alhamdulillah... In the remaining hour until uh, Maghrib, the, we, have, we have a panel discussion. And a lot of you have asked a lot of questions. And some of them are fatawa based. And some of them are good questions, but there's too many to answer. So what we've decided is that we've picked a few uh, topics. And inshallah, we're going to pitch them to the, or some of these questions to the du'at. And inshallah, those that want to answer can answer. And those that don't want to answer don't, need, don't have to answer. Now... To ask every single person individually is going to take a lot of time and I don't think we're going to get through maybe two questions if every person gives an answer. So the way we're going to do this, inshallah, is we're going to split the panel into two. With those on my right, starting from Ustad Tim all the way until uh, now we have Ustad Rashid Madani, who's also the <laughs> Imam of uh, BD7 Masjid, uh, Masjid Huda. He joined us as well. So this is the, on the right of me and I'm a little left from Ustad Ibrahim until uh, Ustad Ihsan and Ustad Ihsan, he joined us as well. He's the Imam of Islam Dewsbury, which is only about 20 minutes away. Also a graduate of uh, Medina, faculty of uh, Da'wah. So we're going to split the panel into two. So each question I'm going to direct it towards one half. So that half will be given the opportunity to answer, inshallah. And then the next question will be given to the other half. Yeah. If any of the du'at which are not on the half that's being asked the question really want to answer, khalas, we can let them answer, inshallah. But primarily it's going to be towards um, those who, uh, the side which is being asked the, the question. So, the first question is, I'm going to ask this to my right, inshallah. So, we're going to start from uh, Sal Rashid, coming this day, uh, The first question is that, especially in the 21st century, in England, we have many ideologies, many isms from non-Muslims, from people of innovation within Islam. You know, so many different ideologies and isms. What's the best way for a person living in the West, especially in the UK, in these times, uh, what's the best way for them to tackle and to deal with these um, ideologies and these isms? Now, start with, on the right, inshallah, start Rashid. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'ina ma ba'd. First and foremost, one should actually consider the, having the sincerity only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-raziq, al-khaliq, al-qadir ala kulli shay. So when the sincerity is in there, then of course everything would fall into place, whether it is from the kalimat uh, al-tawheed, la ilaha illallah, and the second part of the kalimat that is Muhammad Rasulullah. And when we have all these things understood, then inshallah the one would become so solidified that anything that comes afterwards, he would understand the meaning of as-sabr, because sabr is in this day and age quite often we are missing. Why? Because we are, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, 
So that is the reality that we are created because we like to be haste always. One should take a step back and think about what points that uh, a, a, a Muslim is missing in his lifestyle first and foremost, and that is to have the sincerity turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When these things are solid, when these things are constantly practiced, eventually the people that he or she is responsible for, they will have the positive impact on it. And that is something quite often we're missing. Why? Going back to the issue that we are always uh, hasty. So a deen, uh, in terms of having the sincerity, then following everything as best as one should, uh, one should do uh, in terms of salawat and letting the children see their role models, meaning that the parents need to be role models. So when they are practicing what Islam requires of him, then inshallah al-aziz, everything would fall into uh, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, inshallah al-aziz. Now, this issue of isms that exist in the West and the society that we live in, generally the way it can have an effect on a person is one of two ways. It can either affect them from the angle of that which relates to shubuhat in terms of doubts or that which relates to shahawat in terms of desires. So it will either push a person away from the religion of Islam from the angle of doubts entering into their hearts or it will push a person into following their desires because they will make excuses for themselves and because of the way that they are thinking has been affected by these isms, whether it be directly through things that they watch, indirectly through the circles that they're in, uh, the places that they study at, the people that they work with, all of these things have an effect on you as a Muslim. And the place that it has an effect is your heart. Yani the shubuhat and the shahawat, the, the, the doubts and the desires, both of them have an effect on your heart. You as a believer, it is important to purify your heart and to protect your heart. How can you protect your heart? Because this will be a way for you to repel a shubuhat. The best way is for you to learn about your religion. And to have yaqeen that the religion of Islam is superior to any way of life. In the deen Allah islam That the only religion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only religion accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the religion of, of al-Islam. When a person learns about their religion and they learn about their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is difficult for them to be afflict, afflicted by many of the isms that exist. Why? Because you will see, when they are talking about the religion of Islam, they have a standard of morals that they judge the religion of Islam by. Us as Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the best standard to live your life by. The best standard to judge what is right and what is wrong. So who, who has a better standard? A standard that was made up by the creation who are weak in many different aspects or a, stand, or a standard that was given to you by your Lord who is perfect in all aspects. This specific point is, an issue, is, 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 is a cure for many of uh, the, 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 the isms that have an effect on the hearts of the, of the Muslims that exist in the West. They feel like they are inferior when in reality they are superior. You as a Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised you. Because of your iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already raised you. And you would see the people of knowledge, Allah has raised them even more. Now this knowledge that they have, that they have been raised because of, how does it affect them? Number one, it is a means for their heart to be protected. Number two, it is a means for them to know their Lord. So it helps them when it comes to navigating their shahawat. So these are the most important things. In terms of purifying your heart, then the best way is through righteous actions. All of us have heard of the famous hadith of, hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where he talked about the effects of sins on the heart and how it places a black dot on the heart and how, and how when you do a righteous deed, it wipes it away. So it's important, ikhwan. Protect your heart. Be wary of what you watch and what you listen to and what you say and who you interact with and who you allow to influence you. It's extremely important. And learn about your religion. Learn about your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah yibarak fikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi jama'in. Just to add with what um, our two sheikhs have said, the ulama, when they categorize ilm, they categorize it as two types of knowledge. Al-ilm al-dururi wal-ilm al-nadhari. Al-ilm al-dururi 
um, is things that we all agree in. What goes up must come down. Hot, cold, you know, taste, smell. These are things that we all know are facts. And then you've got the second type of knowledge, which is knowledge that happens by you having to investigate and look into and think about. So we as Muslims, we've been given one viewpoint. That viewpoint is that what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him is the truth, al-Islam. We believe it to be true. So when we hear a hadith of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and a hadith and ayat um, and statements from you know, the prize predecessors and things like that, we believe it and we look at it from a standpoint of it being true. On the other side of that, you have people who don't have that belief. So the question is, when those people look at these hadith and ayat and things like that, what, point, what standpoint are they looking at it from? They're looking at it from a viewpoint that what they're reading is false. So the question you now have to ask yourself is, this person, whoever it may be, these isms and schisms, when they're looking at Islam, are they going to look at Islam from the viewpoint of it being truth or from it being falsehood? That's the question you have to ask before you even ingest any information or when you come across any information. Once you understand what viewpoint he's coming from, you'll be able to know whether or not he has a bias or a motive that you know, is you know, one which is not good. And as, Allah, and as uh, our brother Sheikh uh, said to us here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us, has given us the upper hand. Umar radiallahu anhu said, نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ عَزَّنَ اللَّهُ بِالْإِسْلَامِ we are people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us idza by al-Islam. So when you come across any ideology or any viewpoint, you need to ask yourself, where is this coming from? And just the last point. I once gave a talk at a university, a top university in London. So I was speaking about one uh, issue of marriage between man and woman. At the end of the talk, I was barraged with, with questions, most of them coming from the sister section. And one of the issues was, was they had a problem with some of the things I was saying regarding the relationship between man and women. And the question they asked was this. They said, why is it that in, in, in Muslim countries, women are not allowed to have divorce? Now, that question, number one, is false. Because a woman doesn't have the ability to divorce, but she has another thing known as khul'a, annulment. The marriage can be annulled under specific guidelines. So we can, so whether or not you want to call it divorce or annulment, khalas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave certain abilities to the man with regards to rendering the marriage none and void. However, the question is that I asked to the person is what makes you ask that question and what makes you think that what Islam came with is problematic? The thing that makes you ask uh, or makes you think that Islam is problematic is the fact that there are people who try to critique the religion of Islam and say things about the ahkam of the sharia. So that person who's asking a question, thinking that there's a problem with Islam, doesn't even know that they are not brainwashed, but they have an issue with the, with the way in which they think. That when a critique, a non-Muslim person criticizing the religion, they took it to be gospel, but then when the Islam said something, they looked at it from a viewpoint of this isn't right. So they have to ask this question, what do they mean by this isn't right? Under whose pretense is it not right? Is it not right under what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said? Or is it incorrect because of the viewpoint of the person who wrote the article against Islam? So you have to ask yourself a question. So when you come across this kind of information, you have to ask yourself, من الكاتب, who's the person writing this? What is their viewpoint and what do they believe in? And then you make the decision. Is haq going to come from this? And is batil or falsehood going to come from this? And as Sheikh, and as, um, Sheikh Muhammad said, if you want to protect your heart, then you'll know that this is something that is better to stay away from. Or when reading it, you have to look at it with a, great, with a, with a grain of salt or you have to look at it with you know, a, a doubtful eye. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So know, uh, think about the naqil, the person giving the information. Just like in hadith, there are shurut, there are conditions for the person to narrate the hadith. Why? So we can ensure that the information receiving is correct. So likewise, when you're now receiving uh, 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 information, 
you need to ask yourself, is the person giving me the information upon sound foundations or not? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Assalamu alaikum wa wabarakatuh. First and foremost, my brothers, Allah, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I love you all for the sake of Allah. It's really nice to see the brothers all under one roof and also the uh, wonderful asatid and the mashayikh that came down. I don't want to make this too long. I'm going to mention three things, right? And these would be the three focal points that I would discuss and elaborate on when delivering a lecture, the root causes for deviation, right? I just came back from Canada. I was deliberalizing some of the university students, right? Um, so I've been delivering a lot of lectures and programs pertaining to feminism, liberalism, whatever have you. But the general lecture, root causes for deviation, we can maybe what put it down to three things. Number one, lack of knowledge. Jahal. Lack of knowledge, my brothers and my sisters. Right? Sometimes a sister may turn towards feminism simply because her husband is treating her a certain way, justifying his actions with the Sharia. When in reality, the Sharia is what? Free from that. He might even quote the Quran and the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu And she's thinking to herself, if this is Islam, you know what? Let's call it a day. Let me just go to my girlies, the feminists. Right? That's ignorance on both sides of the spectrum here. However, if she knew her deen, she'll turn around to him and say, listen, that's not happening. Allah said this and the Prophet Sallallahu said that. When I conduct these you know, programs on the status of a woman and also feminism, every time, every single time, sisters come up and say, Wallah, I didn't even know that I was entitled to these rights. I didn't know. Right? We don't need feminism. We don't need red pill. Right? We have to be fair here. Red pill and feminism. Right? We have Islam and Islam is the answer. Every ideology other than the religion of Islam, there's always going to be what? Holes in the narrative. Number two, guys. Number two. Number two. Lack of propagation of that which is correct. If we are silent, my brothers and my sisters, and we are not doing that which, should be, that which we should be doing, and that is learning our religion and propagating that which is correct, the opposite is going to take a stronghold. Red pill is a knee-jerk reaction to feminism. The men felt bullied all of these years, so now red pill is there to, you know, give the men back their mas masculinity. Like, we don't need that. So you're always going to get knee-jerk reactions and different things popping out of nowhere. However, if we call to that which is correct, inshallah ta'ala, the next generation, they're going to be upon clarity. Now you have, by the way, I'm not inciting violence, huh? just in case we have channel 4 here that wants to take out of context what I'm about to say I'm not inciting violence towards the rainbow team right how is it that they are so powerful and so loud and they come across as the majority Lesh, cave right even though they're a raindrop compared to everyone else صح? because they're actively playing their role in standing up for what they see to be morally acceptable while we Muslims were terrified I actually commend them in that Right? They come out and they identify as this and identify as that. Now they're identifying as cats and they're taking pictures with no hayat and putting on Twitter. They're not shy about it. We Muslims, ya jama'a, right? We wallahi, we fear for the next generation. If you don't clarify and you don't call out to what is correct, my brothers and my sisters, wallahi, for a whole year I was speaking to solicitors. Whole year. What can I say? What can I not? How much can I, you know, push the roof? Right? I'm not underground, am I? A lot of my videos on YouTube, they're very colorful. We always put what? The disclaimers at the beginning. There's ways around it. Number three, my brothers and my sisters, lack of tawheed. Lack of tawheed of who Allah Azza wa Jal is. Right? Sometimes we focus too much on the debates. Right? Instead of actually learning who Allah Azza wa Jal is. Right? Teaching the people what they need to believe and focusing on that and emphasizing on that instead of maybe what one doesn't need to believe. People are in need of learning who Allah Azza wa is, His names and His attributes and internalizing that. Today when Allah says something and then you got Simon de Beauvoir, the feminist, who says another, well, Allah is just Simon against who? Allah. Which one shall I take? They don't know who Allah Azza wa is. Learning who Allah Azza wa is, my brothers and my sisters, at tawheed 
Our only source of knowledge that we have of Allah is what? His names and attributes. Learn that, my brothers and my sisters, and perhaps whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned, it will have a different impact on your heart. Sometimes people say, what does Islam say about this? What does Islam say about that? No, ask me, what does Allah say? Right? Don't turn Islam into some human being. And that's all because of what? The lack of connection that we have of Allah and the lack of knowledge. People respect people based on what? What they know of them, right? But when it comes to Allah, there's no respect because we don't know anything about him. Sorry, Shaykh. Barakallahu feekum. Uh, one of the things that's very, very hard to do in a panel discussion is to come last. Because the Mashaykh gave so many good answers. So, well, I, I just want to say something in, call it like a little summary and a small piece of advice in keeping away from these things and how we can survive them. The first one is to give a lot of importance to our aqidah, to what we believe. And too many times we ignore these things and we don't teach it to our children and we don't focus upon it. Because most of these issues, these issues come back to what people believe. Their belief systems, right? Their ideas of ideologies and beliefs. So we have to combat that with pure, sincere, clean aqidah. That's the first point. The second point that I want to make is practicing your religion. And Mashaykh already mentioned it, but wallahi, it's very important. I used to sometimes discuss with people who had left the religion people who had turned away and become atheist or agnostic. And I used to believe that always this issue was an intellectual, ideological issue. And that their problem was just an issue of delir. And if I can prove to you that it's wrong, then you can, you'll accept it from me. And in the end, what I came to realize is that so many of them followed their shahawat, their desires. And it was actually the case that these isms came out of a willingness to justify what their desires already took on board and what their heart already took on board. And the last thing that I want to mention is the very famous hadith of Hudayfa radiyallahu an, in which he said, كَانَ النَّاسُ يَسْأَلُونَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَنِ الْخَيْرِ وَكُنْتُ أَسْأَلُهُ عَنِ الشَّرِّ مَخَافَةَ أَنْ يُدْرِكَنِي So the people used to ask the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم about good and I used to ask him about bad things out of a fear that it would happen to me. And there's two things I want from that. The first one is having a reasonable amount of knowledge about what the danger is. That doesn't mean I want you to go read the books of these people and to you know, delve into what they say and to be captured by what they say. But just to have a reasonable amount of awareness of what is happening among you, among our kids, our brothers and sisters, so that you can keep away from it. And the second thing is to have a fear of losing this blessing that Allah gave you. Because too many of us believe that Islam is a given that you've given, been given it as a birthright. And it will never be taken away from you and never could your heart ever be affected by something. But that is something that doesn't go in line with what we have been taught in the Quran and the Sunnah and the fear that the early generations used to have over themselves and their religion. So be fearful over it and something you care about and you're fearful over, you'll always try to protect it. And Allah Azza wa Jalla best. Jazakumullah khairan. I think what's harder than being last is being the host to making sure that everyone's on time. So we took a lot of time on that question. So I'll have to cap the next answers, inshallah, to two to three minutes. So let's try to keep it you know, uh, precise, inshallah, because we've got quite a few questions. Um, the next question. Let's press the button. Right. Next question is, uh, in this day and age, along with these contemporary ideologies and isms, there's, there's a lot of uh, fitna and looking at that which is haram, whether male or female, is something which is widespread and very easy for people to fall into. So what is your advice uh, in regards to this? How can a person stop uh, falling into these types of uh, sins? No. Uh, the sual is, uh, how can a person stop himself from looking at haram and keeping away from these types of sins? From the right, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam rasulillah. So in general, regarding the question, I believe what our previous mashaykh have mentioned is very relative. Of the things that is often mentioned is when you are aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, truly, this is the biggest obstacle. As Allah mentions, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَاءِ فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَىٰ 
So prior to prohibiting yourself from your desires, you have to remind yourself that one day you're going to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's no action that you have done except that's been recorded. So when you know Allah and you're able to achieve that level of worship in Allah as if you can see him, which is our objective of Ihsan, as mentioned in the hadith of Jibril, السلام, when you can either worship Allah as if Allah is right in front of you, you're looking at Allah knowing that you have to have that shyness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you're not able to do so, then you know that Allah is always observant of you. Has entrusted those angels to record your deeds. And it's going to come a time, nothing will be left. Nothing will be left. That which you did and that which you left off will be brought to your attention. So when a person truly reminds themselves that they're going to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the greatest factor that will allow you to prohibit your nafs from its desires. And then when you know the fruits of that, because all of these maladhat dunya are temporary and short-lived, is it worth the sacrifice? Well, Allah mentions, بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبَقَى You're giving preference to something that is short-lived as a sacrifice for the hereafter that is what? That is better and everlasting. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad Sallam mentioned, الْكَيِّسُ مَنْ دَانَ نَفْسَهُ وَعَمِلَ لِمَا بَعْدِ الْمَوْتِ the wise man is the one who holds themselves to account and acts in preparation for that which is going to occur after death. So when you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remind yourself of the status of Allah that you're going to stand before him and be held accountable, for me that is the greatest factor to preventing yourself from following the desires and looking into these things that are not permissible. No. No. Alhamdulillah. <coughs> I think from the ways that will help you to stay from following your desires and disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal is by knowing the dangers of disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal. As the poet he mentions and he says, تَثْنَ اللَّذَاذَ تُمِمَّ لَنَا صَفْوَتَهَا مِنَ الْحَرَامِ وَيَبْقَى الْخِزِّ وَالْعَارُ تَبْقَى عَوَاقِبَ سُوَنْ فِي مَغَبَّتِهَا الْآخِرَ مِنْ لَذَّةٍ مِنْ بَعْدِهَا النَّارُ Which means that the pleasure of sinning and disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal is, is, is eventually that pleasure is going to be removed and what's going to be left disgrace and the sin is going to be there and then after he says لا خير من لذة من بعدها النار there is no goodness in a sin that is a, and a pleasure that will be followed by the hellfire so making sure that you stay away from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing the consequences of disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let's number one Number two is knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more that your iman will increase and, and the more that your fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he measures and he says, it is the ulama, the ones who truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the more you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more that you'll be staying away from all the shahawat. And the last thing is, striving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you abstain yourself from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you know, from the types of patience is that you are patience from not disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it requires patience. And that's why Allah azza wa jalla, he mentions and he says, Salamun alaykum bima sabartum fani'am ma'uqba ad-dar. Salam, peace be upon you for your patience and for you is the abode of Jannah. So being patient upon not disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal and knowing if you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it can lead you to the hellfire and knowing you can obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it will lead you to al-jannah. And the third thing and I would conclude with this is making sure that you have good companions around you that really really helps and that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he mentions and he says that the individual is upon the religion of his companion so know who your companion is. Having righteous friends. Allah Azza wa Jal, He told us to be patient with the righteous. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He mentions and He says, لا تصاحب إلا مؤمن That your friend and your companion should only be a believer. And only a pious individual should be eating from your food. So if the person is not pious, don't feed him. I'm just joking by the way. Making sure that you have righteous individual friends that will help you remember Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and there's a saying in Arabic, as-sahib, sahib. 
that your companion is the one that pulls you either towards good or either towards evil. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions and he says that friends on the day of resurrection, Yawm al Qiyamah, there'll be enemies to one another except for those who are pious. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions and he says, on the day of resurrection, a person will be biting on his finger and say, Woe to me, woe to me. I wish I have not taken so and so as a friend. He has misled me from the guidance after the guidance came to me. Barakallah fikum and Allah knows best. I can't really add much other than what Allah mentioned in the Quran. Say to the believers, lower your gaze. Don't look at TV, don't look at women. Don't look, look down all the time, even if they're just walking past. Allah is going to cause another desire. And uh, I recommend to read the book, Ad Dawah, the Wabi Ibn Qayyim, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He speaks about it in great detail. And also get married. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya ma'ashara al-shabaab min istata'a minkum al-ba'ata fali tazawwaj fa'innu aghaddu al-basar. If you get married, it helps you. Lo ya gaze, wallahu a'lam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in ma ba'd. And if you can't get married, then you must make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah jalla wa ala, he said, Wa qala rabbukum wa du'uni astajib lakum. And your Lord says, call upon me, I will respond to you. There's a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will respond to the dua if it is sincere. And every single person who sins recognizes in themselves that they have. If he has a mithqal dhurra of iman, if he has an atom's weight of iman in his heart, he knows that he has sinned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he regrets that. That regret and that remorse you feel in your heart, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, anadamu tawbah. He said that regretness that you feel in your heart is tawbah in its actuality. So call upon Allah Jalla wa ala and ask Him to aid you in stopping your sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who you return to, you look towards, you have hope in. He is al ghafur and al rahim But do not deceive yourself. Allah Jalla wa ala is also shadeed al iqab We talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment and that how death will approach us, etc., etc. But know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also is ghafoor and rahim that you have a Lord to turn back to. And just like He is the one subhanahu wa ta'ala who governs all of the affairs of the universe and the destiny, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who also can help you against your sins, help you against yourself, and help you against the shaitan. And always make istighfar and turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance and tawbah, and never stop. But at the same time, do not deceive yourselves. Wallahu a'lam. I just wanted to add a very small uh, point, which I think in a practical way might help the kind of people who, or the person who is asking about this kind of question. And that is to look at how does the shaitan overcome you in this particular issue? Yani what is the things that caused you to get to that point? For some people, for example, it is being alone. And being alone with your phone, being alone with your computer, being alone with the TV, for some people, it's just so simple. It's just a matter of take your computer out of your room when you go to sleep at night, for example. So a person looks, how does shaitan trick me to get into this? And what are the causes that led me to fall into this? And then try to put blocks, roadblocks along those, those causes. Yani for some people, it's having their phone with un unrestricted, yani without any blocks on it. So they can put it on their phone so they can block it so they won't be able to access those things again. But you have to look at how you fell into a sin so that you can try to avoid it and Allah knows best. The next question is for the right side, inshallah. That includes you as well. Is, this is a two-part question. Um, and it's regarding seeking knowledge that for a student living in the West, what are the things that he needs to know? What are the things that he needs to learn? And the second part of the question is, when is it allowed for a person, for a student who's studying, when is it allowed for him to start speaking and start um, either giving da'wah or even maybe answering questions and giving their opinions and so on? So it's a two-part question. What are the things that a student of knowledge in the UK needs to learn? And secondly, when they learn, what level do they have to get to? Or when is it allowed for them to start speaking about Islamic issues? No. You said two minutes for each one, right? Two minutes for each one, no. Two minutes. 
Also, you can give three for this one because it's two parts. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I think first a Muslim living in the West should connect himself with the Kitab Allah Azza wa Jal, starting the memorization of Al-Quran Al-Kareem in the best way possible. And there are ample examples that we see even in this day and age how people can actually uh, benefit from seeking knowledge primarily with the Suhbat Al-Quran. The Quran, when you leave the company of it, no matter how much knowledge you acquire in Al-Islam, it will, it will be always fruitless. So start with Al-Quran Al-Kareem. Know what the words of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mean to you, how you are connected to the words of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and how you can have the barakah through Al-Quran Al-Kareem in the upcoming days. And know who Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is. Anything and everything that you see uh, mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam should be your priority. And the reason I'm saying this is that at the end of the day, when it comes to the seeking of knowledge in this part of the world, we can be easily distracted. We sometimes fall short in many things. We jump into every places. So know your goals first and start with Al-Quran Al-Kareem. And later on, see where you are when it comes to your actions. We know the example of Amir al-Mu'minin, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. For him, it took two and a half years or more than that just to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah. And it's just not the hifd, rather hifd ma'at tadabbur. He had to also understand and comprehend what Surah Al-Baqarah was to him. So go through the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second part of the question was what, if you don't if you remind me? When, when can a person start speaking about the religion? You don't, you don't have to answer both, you can answer one if you want as well. <laughs> Hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes that Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmi al-akhir fal yakul khairan aw li yasmut. Aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. Whosoever believes in Allah and in the last day, then let him speak of, uh, of goodness or stay quiet. If you have anything good to say, say it. If you don't have anything good to say, know to be quiet. That is, in a nutshell, I would say. Barakallahu feek. I'll answer the first part. So when it comes to what should uh, a person in the West start with in terms of seeking knowledge, yani after Sheikh Rashid mentioned uh, in terms of the Quran, the Quran is considered to be one of the most important things that you should start with and it's one of the best things to help you stay connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's one of the best things. Another thing, another benefit of the Quran that is that it will teach you discipline because you, it's impossible for you to find a hafiz except that he has a time that he would memorize and a time that he would revise. Up until today, if he still has his Quran that is strong, you know that he has a time in, in the day that is specific for the Quran. It's not when I'm free, I'll go over the Qur'an. It's a specific time that he goes over it. So it will give you discipline, and discipline is something you need when you're seeking knowledge. As for what do you need to learn, يعني, what should you start with? Look at what the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to Mu'adh when he was sending him to Yemen. He said, min ahl kitab. You are going to a people of the book. So we can see from this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is teaching Mu'adh how to teach the people the religion of Islam. What's the most important thing to teach them? So the Prophet ﷺ commanded him to start off with number one, with Tawheed. If they accept that from you, then the Prophet ﷺ followed, followed it up with Salah and then followed it up with Zakah. So for number one, your Aqeedah, your Creed. Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is the Prophet ﷺ? Uh, Arkan, Arkan al-Iman, what are they? Right? These Masa'id that relate to Iman. Uh, that you can find within the hadith of Jibreel and you can find in some other books that the ulama rahimahumullah, have simplified for you, start with that. طيب, that's in terms of your creed. A Muslim is not that which they only believe. They are people of action as well. Why? Because iman is qawlun wa amrun wa atiqad. It is statement, belief in the heart, statement on the tongue and actions of the limbs. So now it comes to your acts of worship and the things you do on a daily basis. So your acts of worship such as salah because you do it on a daily basis. When it comes to the month of Ramadan, then you need to know the rulings of fasting. You will not be excused. You as a Muslim will not be excused for cert for the wajibat that are obligatory upon you for you to fulfill. In terms of you being ignorant, especially when you have an opportunity to learn. Yani in this type of situation, there may be certain exceptional circumstances where a person may be excused. 
But for us living here, يعني, we don't fall into that category. On top of that, what's from it? Zakah. Zakat of what? Zakat al-fitr and the zakat of your mal. Both of these things you need to know. And why do I mention this? Because most of us work. Most of us have an income. Some of us might have savings. Some of us might have investments. We need to know that. Uh, when should we pay zakah? When should we not pay zakah? Is zakah obligatory upon me now? Is zakah not obligatory upon me? How many times would you find in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a salah and mentions zakah straight after it? Many of us concentrate on salah and we forget about another pillar of, of Islam. So these daily actions that you do in terms of acts of worship. If you're a person who's involved in trade, right? Uh, or shall I say, uh, you ha- you're involved in trading commodities, trading in general, you offer a service, you have a business, any of these type of things. You need to know the ahkam of it. So what? So you don't fall into riba. You don't fall into riba. And there's many situations that a person can fall into riba today and they're ignorant of it. When they shouldn't be ignorant of it. Allah yibari fikum. I'll leave the rest for the mashayikh to answer. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Bunya al-Islam ala khams. Islam is built upon five. And those five are what the Sheikh said. Shahadatu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah. Wa iqam salah to establish the prayer. Wa ita'i zakat to give the zakat. Wa hajj al-bayt and to make hajj to the house if one is able to. Wa sawmi ramadana and to fast the month of Ramadan. So now the Muslim asks, what is... Like the, the question I asked, what is, it, what is upon a Muslim to know? The first thing a person needs to know, as what the Sheikh Muhammad said, is you need to know the core basics of your religion. You need to know the core basics of your religion. Now the second question is, for a person who maybe knows the basics of their religion, do they want to know more and how much more do they want to know? If a person has started to practice Islam, and he doesn't know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, he doesn't know about Allah's names, his attributes, he doesn't know how to pray, he doesn't know how to give zakat, then like we said, a person needs to study that, read that, or try to acquire that information to the best of their ability. Once a person gets to that level, is it upon that person now to get into every single detailed argument on an issue of aqidah? No. If you look at what uh, Sheikh Muhammad said about the hadith of Jibreel, I'm not the hadith of Jibreel, the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal when he went to uh, the people of Yemen. The Prophet ﷺ gave him very clear commands as to what to teach. Teach him about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who he is, who the Messenger of Allah sallallahu is, and what this religion is all about. Islam is very simple. It's Muslims who overcomplicate it. So it's not upon Muslims now who perhaps may not have understanding of Arabic, may not understand fiqh, may not understand aqidah, to go onto YouTube and things like that and start looking at videos going back and forth between people who are claiming to speak about Islam without knowledge and he said, she said, debates and all those things. Those things are not going to benefit you in the akhirah. They're not going to benefit you in your religion and they're not going to bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, that's the first thing. So a person needs to stick to what will benefit him in terms of knowing Allah and his actions. And, for example, the actions, like he said, zakat, salah, hajj, uh, uh, and things like that. Now there's the second question. uh, 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 That's the first category. The second category, afwan, I'll just speak this quickly, is the person who actually wants to seek knowledge and embark on seeking knowledge. If that person wants to embark on seeking knowledge, as the two shuyukh said to us today, um, Memorizing the Quran and learning the Arabic language and embarking on of a life of seeking knowledge. But what a person should not do is not do uh, what I just said, I embark on seeking knowledge, but still has this desire to learn and read about things which are shared, which are, you know, which don't make sense to that person and to delve into those issues because those things will not benefit you in your religion. And as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk. Be diligent upon that which is beneficial to yourself. Back and forth, speaking about things that don't really that are opaque and don't make any sense to you will not benefit you in your religion. What is the thing that is going to benefit you in your religion, make you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get you good deeds? These are the questions you need to ask and this is what you need to embark on doing and not doing <clears throat> the opposite of that. Barakallahu feekum. I'm going to make this very, very short. My brothers and my sisters, the most important science that every single one of us should be uh, learning, young and old, male and female, is the knowledge that teaches you about who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, and that is what, ilm al-tawheed. 
right? There's a very well-known statement of Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi, and other scholars, they added bits and bobs to it. Man kana lillahi a'raf, kana billahi akhwaf. Right? A lot of these situations that people find themselves in, committing the sin, feminism, this ism, that, right? Like we mentioned before, lack of knowledge of who Allah Azza wa Jalla is. So the statement, man kana billahi a'raf kana, or man kana lillahi a'raf kana billahi akhwaf. Whoever has more knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more conscious he is going to be of him. The more fearful you are going to be of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're going to be more inclined in doing acts of worship. More distant you're going to be of sinning, my brothers and my sisters. Learn who Allah Azza wa Jal is, his names, and how you can internalize it and apply it in your day-to-day -day lives, right? And what these names hold in attributes. Second question, my brothers and my sisters, the hadith that comes to mind, and I think is important touching on it. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did say, بَلِّغُ anni وَلَوْ ayah." Convey from me even if it is one ayah. Convey from me even if it is, right, one verse. However, a lot of the time, this is snippeted from the hadith, right? And we don't take into consideration the end part of the hadith. What does the end part say? وَمَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيْهِ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّ مَقْعَدُ مِنَ النَّارِ Whoever lies about me intentionally, let him book his seat in the hellfire. And there are different variations of this hadith. مَنْ يَقُلْ عَلَيَّ مَا لَمْ يَقُلْ مَا لَمْ أَقُلْ فَلْيَتَبَوَّ مَقْعَدُ مِنَ النَّارِ Whoever says about me that which I haven't said, let him book his seat in the hellfire. Someone may say, I'm sticking within my lane. طيب, good. Right? I'm only going to convey that which I heard the way I heard it. I'm just what a transmitter. No one can stop me from doing so. There are matters that you've studied which you then go and convey. However, and this is where you have the problem, right? Someone thinks that he's staying in his lane, but a lot of the time he steps out of it. And he starts speaking about the things that he shouldn't be speaking about. And the Messiah has warned us from that. Ar-Ruwaybadah. Right? At-Tafih yatakallim fi umur al-Amma. He said, I warn you of the Ruwaybadah. They asked, who are the Ruwaybadah? Some individual who barely has any knowledge, right? And he's speaking about big issues of the religion. He's speaking about big issues of the religion. Be careful of that, my brothers and my sisters. Don't speak about the religion without knowledge. Many people think they know that which they're speaking about, and a lot of the time they fall into that which is extremely problematic. No, it's all the shake. One thing that uh, came to mind is a statement of Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala when he was asked a question about seeking knowledge. He said, Talabul ilmi hasanun jameel. He said, seeking knowledge is something really well and good. Walakin indur ma yalzamuka min hina tusbih ila an tumsi falzamhu. Aw kama qal. He said, Talab al-ilm is something amazing. It's really well and good. But look at what you need from the minute you wake up until the minute you go to sleep and learn that first. So the very first thing you need before you start going into all of the subsidiary and the separate sciences and matters is to be able to get from the morning to the evening with proper Islamic knowledge. That's the first thing. After that, to be aware that Islamic knowledge is made up of many sciences and each science has its right over you. As was mentioned, it's not just aqidah, but aqidah also, and fiqh, and it's supporting sciences, and hadith, and tafsir. If you just take it as learning Islam as a whole, it's very difficult to progress. Instead, take each one and make sure you give it its right. No doubt within those, some of them are more important than others. So we begin with aqidah, no doubt. And there's no doubt the attention that we give to the Qur'an and to the sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the actions that a Muslim needs from day to day, which is part of al-fiqh. So this is important as well. When it comes to speaking, I just have a couple of small pieces of advice. The first one is to delay speaking in front of people as much as you are able to do. Now there's times when you don't have a choice. There's nobody around except you and you're the person who has the most knowledge in that gathering and you need to give an answer in that moment, I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you at that time. 
But too many times there's a situation where you put yourself forward and there are many other people who could have put themselves forward before you. So try to delay speaking as much as you can. And be careful of the things that destroy a person. And you've already heard lying about the religion and about the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And from the things which destroy a person is the issue of giving fatawa. It's very different when you convey a hadith from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like you heard it. You heard it and you conveyed it. And it's very different when you give a person a verdict on their specific situation. So be careful about these issues as well. And be careful about something which the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us. He said that the hour will not come until knowledge is taken from al-asaghir, from the junior people. There's a narration from some of the early generations about this, about this narration in which they said, if a junior person narrates from a senior person, they're not considered to be junior. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you all? If you are someone with not as much knowledge, but you're narrating what your mashayikh told you as they told it to you, you'll be fine, inshallah. But as soon as you start to be independent and you start to do things without reference to what your teacher said and before that without reference to the Qur'an and the Sunnah and what the early generations were upon, then this is something that causes a person to destroy themselves and to destroy others. They give fatawa without knowledge, so they misguide themselves and they misguide others and Allah is what most best. So Shaykh Hudayfa, I forgot something that I really wanted to miss that right. You know, my brothers and my sisters, I just want to encourage everyone to seek knowledge properly. I know coming to lectures are wonderful. I give a lot of lectures. More lectures, perhaps, maybe than the durus that I teach. And I teach Monday to Thursday. My Fridays and my Saturdays are normally for lectures going around. Why do I do that? Three reasons. Number one, many people don't realize that they have to seek knowledge. Right? So to raise awareness. Many people think seeking knowledge is like a career path in engineering. Only if I want to become the next mufti. The second thing, my brothers and my sisters, is why I do a lot of lectures is because most people are not ideological, right? They don't have anything, so they need to be guided to that which is correct. Otherwise, they're going to be exposed to that which is wrong. That's the second reason. And the third reason, my brothers and my sisters, is most people are not students of knowledge. The majority of Muslims in Bradford are they students of knowledge. They're not. In Manchester, Leeds, they're not. So someone needs to cater for that. To raise awareness that they need to now come and start seeking knowledge. So every lecture that I do in it is, you need to go and seek knowledge. That's why we're going through all of these problems, temptations, doubts. Right? These lectures that you come to like today is like what? A painkiller. Paracetamol. That's the way I look at it. It gives you a boost. Your iman goes up. It's just going to come back down again if we're not regularly learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his deen. Does that make sense? Right, next question. Um, so we talked about what to learn and so on. But this is more of a personal question, which is throughout your journey of seeking knowledge, what's your best experience uh, that you've come across? Now, it, it can be something serious, it can be a benefit, it can be something funny. And what was your best experience or what is something which you know, stands out whenever you think back at your journey in seeking knowledge? We'll start with Ibrahim, inshallah. So for me, this today is one of my best experiences in seeking knowledge because um, on my journey here on the train, I had a thought and I said, SubhanAllah, when Allah honors you, don't dishonor yourself. Because myself, I didn't get the opportunity to go to any Islamic university. I applied to all, but Qadallah, I wasn't accepted. So I made a decision that I have to learn Arabic because brother, the last brother who finished Medina books with me, when Dina book one, he said, I'm gone. There's only two of us in the class. He said, I got accepted. So I was just by myself then. So I had to finish. But then, alhamdulillah, the fact that I was able to participate and share a benefit as the objective is just to be a key of a source of goodness, I get to listen to everyone's experience. And everyone who goes away and study, everyone comes back with a different experience. And sometimes people get put off from seeking knowledge. They think if I don't get into an Islamic university, I'm not able to study. But the fact that I pursued the Arabic language, Allah opened many doors 
for me to get close to my sheikh and from them, the thing that I favor the most that many of you may have not be more familiar with me with is translation for the my sheikh. Because that is the only time I get to be close to them. And like a lot of my friends, they will ask me, did you get the sheikh's number? <laughs> so that is my objective. Whenever I get to speak to a sheikh and translate for him, I have my private conversation prior to translating saying, can we go sentence by sentence? Because... <laughs> Oh, the long five minutes, I can't do that one. And then after, can I get your number to ask you questions? Um, because it's important to have that relationship. And things that stand out for me in that journey is the mistakes I've made speaking Arabic to the Mashaykh, and I'll share one. I was asked in Sheikh Falah, Rahimullah's house, to ask a question on behalf of the sisters. And it was about the masala of adding wool to the hair. And I almost forgot what the word wool is now, a suf, yeah? So I said to the Sheikh, Ma hukum jam sufan ila sha'ar. And everyone started laughing, even the Sheikh laughing until I see his molatif. <laughs> and, and he said, <laughs> I had a I kept saying, Ma hukum jam sufan ila sha'ar. And sufan is jam safina. It's the plural of a ship. So I said, Sheikh, what's the ruling of women adding ships to their hair? <laughs> and wallahi, but these moments, it's like you enjoy them. To see that, because sometimes you don't get to see the nature of a person from the Ahlul Am, you think they're just mutashaddid there. To see them smile and just have those normal situations, you appreciate those moments because of the things that some of us, the mistakes I think many of us make when we try to pursue, pursue knowledge, we force a change of personality. And you no longer be yourself. And for some, Al Asaf actually leads to Junun because they no longer know themselves, they don't have a, a character anymore. It becomes something that is forced. So those are my experiences that I enjoy. And I know you would have seen some of the videos when you just have, there's a picture of me and the Sheikh, we're just looking at each other, just, just laughing. And alhamdulillah, that's been the best opportunities for me that I'm grateful for. I mean, ask her to increase many opportunities like this for us all. I mean. Alhamdulillah. I would say for me, it was benefiting from the scholars and sitting with them and learning from their character and their mannerism and, and, the, and how they deal with others. And subhanAllah, every sheikh that I met, there was something special about this sheikh. And some, you would learn patience from them. And some of my scholars, or some of the mashaykh that I would know, they would be, they're so busy, but they would sit at the, and they would answer every single person's question until they answer every, person, every, every single person's question. Sometimes it takes one or two hours, and these, and these mashaykh, these scholars, they have families and they have other things to do. Also, from the things that I really uh, benefited from was the humbleness of the ulama and how humble they are. And I remember one time I was in the dars of one of our mashaykh, Sheikh Saad al-Shithri, Hafizahullah, he's one of the scholars in Saudi Arabia, that he taught us humbleness that in the class, he was teaching a usul al-fiqh, he came and everyone was sitting there. He said, I love every single one of you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every single person that's in this class is better than me. Allahu Akbar. And subhanAllah, he was someone, you know, who comes from a very rich family, um, someone who's a high scholar in the country, advisor to the king. So Allah Azza wa gave him both the deen and also the wealth. And sometimes it's difficult for a person uh, to be humble and he would always remind us to humble ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we would always learn mannerism from him especially when it comes to answering questions and and he was someone who was also had the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes a person will ask you a question and they want a quick answer and it's something which is quick sometimes you would ask the sheikh a question and he would know the answer but he would teach you he would say yahtaj mm, ta'amul it needs time to reflect. I remember one time I asked the Sheikh a question. He said, Next week, he answered me and he said, from what's apparent, it's not permissible. So he taught me that not to be hasty. Sometimes you might message a Sheikh and you want a quick, quick answer. He taught me to be patient. And many other stories that you know, I can mention. I'm going to conclude with this story. Um... One of the mashaykh, one of the scholars, um, he's one of the students of Sheikh Ben Baz, Sheikh Abdul Aziz al Rajahi. So I was praying in the haram one day, and he came with the 
Imam of the Haram in the front line. So he was there with the guards. And then they came. I was praying near the janazah. So I was there. After Salah, I went to go speak to the Sheikh. I said, wait, let me finish my athkar. So he was, you know, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 15 minutes. And then I went to the Sheikh. So I said to the Sheikh, you know, I said, what's your name? I said, my name is so-and-so from the UK, etc., etc. And then I said to the Sheikh, I said, Sheikh, make dua that Allah increases me in knowledge. So the Sheikh said, no, 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 no. You make dua that Allah increases me in knowledge. So I said, may Allah increase you in knowledge. So the Sheikh laughed. <laughs> you know, may Allah increase both of us in knowledge. So the Sheikh laughed, you know. SubhanAllah, these, these lessons that you learn from the ulama, and the last thing that really, really I benefit from is being in Saudi Arabia, alhamdulillah, is performing hajj and, and also performing umrah. That's one of the great, greatest blessings that Allah Azza wa Jal has blessed upon me. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentions and he says, keep following hajj and umrah. Why? Because it will remove poverty and sins. Jazakumullah khairan. Sorry for the long ijaba. Uh, for me, I think the same thing, uh, meeting, meeting the scholars, or people of knowledge at least, that was the, the most beneficial thing for me. Um, I, I can't think of specific in, uh, cases, just too many, it's just, it's just lovely to be honest, I don't know what else to say. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> just like the brothers mentioned, uh, subhanAllah, the connection with the ulama is something which is essential for any talib al-ilm, any person who wants to seek knowledge, then he must have that connection with the people of knowledge. But one from the many um, instances that I benefited a lot and one that impacts me even till today is when we were sitting in the majlis of Sheikh Saleh al-Usaymi, hafizahullah ta'ala, when he came to Medina, he has these dawrat. And in one of them he said a sentence, and when he said that, subhanAllah, it instantly stuck in my head. And it's one that I repeat quite often. And that is, مَنْ كَذَبَ فِي الْعِلْمِ فَضَحَهُ اللَّهُ Whoever lies in regards to knowledge, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose that person. And what does it mean to lie in, regard, in regarding knowledge and seeking knowledge? Being somebody who you're not. Trying to portray to the people and demonstrate to them that you have knowledge, when in reality you don't or that you claim to be a person of knowledge. And there's a word for that, they're known as the sa'afiqa. <laughs> a person, who, not that type of sa'afiqa, but those people who claim that they are something but they're not. So the person he hangs around with a businessman, so that people think he's also a businessman. Huh? This is a su'fuq. So when you claim knowledge and you attach yourself but you're lying to the people, you will be exposed one day. Just like the Shaykh said, Man kadaba fil ilmi Allah. And how many people, how many people have been exposed because they open their mouths about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have no knowledge in regards to it. So a person has to be humble, he has to correct his intentions, and he should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna hadal ilma deenun. This knowledge is your religion. So do not play with your religion. Allahu alam. Uh, the same question I'm going to extend it on this side because I do, I do especially you start you know Tim or oh, elders I want to hear some Let stories from uh, quickly yeah. uh, I have a favorite hadith which uh, Sheikh Muhammad Tim Humble knows very well about Sheikh do you remember what it is the Jibreel one ah uh, yeah <laughs> yes, Atani Jibreel fa'amarani an uqaddim al akabir Jibreel came to me Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said and he told me to give precedence to those who are oldest, right? It should actually be the oldest that's speaking from the get-go, right? And then the younger guys who graduated maybe tens of years after. Sahih. Tfadal. Sheikh. Sheikh, we start Sheikh, sorry, are you owner? I don't want to expose people's ages, but... Short on time. Huh? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I... Uh, for the whoever's older, grab the mic. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to choose because we've got uh, time. It starts uh, to move now. Okay. Well, like, let's start with the easy one. So if we were talking about mistakes in Arabic, I think mine is, mine is worse. Mine is definitely worse, 100%. Alhamdulillah, I wasn't, I wasn't in front of one of the mashaykh, but uh, I remember 
and I, the reason I tell you this is that you, you have to make some mistakes. When you make some mistakes, you realize that you learn from them, right? So I was speaking to somebody in my first days in Medina. And he said to me, how do you find the Jamia Islamiyya? How do you find the Islamic University? I said, Alhamdulillah. He said, isn't your study hard? I said, no, Alhamdulillah, I'm not finding it hard. He said to me, what's the hardest thing that you study? So in that time I was in the Ma'had, I was studying Arabic. And I really wanted to say I'rab, the Arabic grammar. But what I said was Irhab, <laughs> terrorism. He looked at me and he said, I think you mean grammar. I said, yeah, that was it. <laughs> what was he thinking about? Allah <laughs> <laughs> As for memories, well, like, there are too many. I could honestly, from every single month or every year, I could give you, wallahi, but uh, from the memories maybe that I've probably spoken about before, but I'll just mention one or two that really stick to me, my first day in the kulliya. So you imagine, graduate from the Islamic, uh, from, in the Islamic University from the Arabic Language Institute, first day in kulliya, first ever lesson. And I walk into the room and it's a small classroom, it's a very small classroom. We had probably 15 people in there at most, maybe 15 people, max 20, very small classroom. And we sit there and I didn't have a timetable, I didn't know what my subject was, or, or maybe I knew which room I had to be in, that was it. And the first of our teachers that we had, because in the Jamia you don't always get scholars teach you, right? But you might get a great scholar, you might just get, you know, someone who's just graduated from PhD and he comes to teach. So you don't always get somebody famous. And, and wallahi, the first person that came to teach us was Sheikh Abdul Razak al-Badr. Habibullah ta'ala, he was teaching us Kitab uh, al-Tawheed. And the first question he asked, he asked regarding intention and regarding the statement of Imam Ahmed that you have an intention to remove ignorance from yourself and other people and out of all the people in the class he picked me to answer that question Wallahi I was so scared My, I forgot the Arabic language I forgot what I had to say I tried to bring the words out slowly like in Wallahi those type of things you remember Wallahi and you remember the great scholars that you spend time with and you, what you learn from them and their, you know, their manners and the way they deal with things. And in that, I will just give you one very small, uh, small story that happened with me when I got into trouble with Sheikh Saleh Sindhi. And I got into trouble with him because he said when he started the class, nobody record the lesson. He said, I'm not going to give any of you permission to record the class. But the thing is that prior to that, he had given a speech. And in that speech he had said, I, in my class, I'm very open with you and I speak very, you know, like openly and, and friendly. And I might say things that are not befitting for someone in an educational, you know, if I was sitting in the haram in front of people. So please don't record my class. I was very slow in taking notes in Arabic. What I understood is what the sheikh didn't want us to spread the recording. But I, I put the recorder in front on my table. I didn't hide it. Maybe 15 lessons went by. 20 lessons went by and every time we come in and look at the recorder on the table and I would just leave it there. And I took that sheikh was giving me permission for it, right? And one time he pointed said, uh, they call me Timothy because that was on the register. He said, Timothy, are you recording the class? I said, yes, sheikh. He said, were you not there in the first class? I said, yes, sheikh, I didn't miss any of your classes. He said, you don't remember that I told you it was not allowed to record? I said, yes, sheikh. He said, come and see me after the class. So he took me in his car, he drove me to the masjid. In this time thinking, this is great, this is the punishment for recording the sheikh's class. I should do this every time. So he took me to the masjid, he took me back, he said, so after the salah, he drove me back and we stopped outside the building and he said, go on then explain to me why you're recording the class. I said, sheikh, wallahi, I made a ta'wil of what you said. And what it is is that you said that you didn't want, you know, how you speak and everything and, and you didn't want to be spread, but I just can't take notes quickly. So I record your class and take notes. He said, okay, delete it. I said, Sheikh, please give me permission just to keep it until I make the notes. So I was pushing it a bit. He said, okay, you can keep it until you make the notes, but as soon as you finish making the notes, then you delete it. And I just saw the wonderful way he dealt with a very difficult situation of a student who didn't listen to what he said. But wallahi, that, the way that he dealt with that, it really shows you something about the benefit of knowledge and, and acting upon it. And Allah is best.
Now after that hadith, you, know, you have to start. Because uh, I need to quickly, I just remembered I have to quickly do something. So I'm going <laughs> I'm to quickly mention my brothers and my sisters, one of my favorite interactions were with a Shaykh Abdul Salam al-Shawai'ir. Very, very humble, very, very nice. You meet him, it is as if you've known him, or well, he's known you for the last 10 years. The way he interacts with you, so much humility, gives everyone time, hugs them, talks to them, laughs with them, right? might even make jokes at times. Right? And Ustad Yaseen and the rest of the brothers can maybe testify because it was actually Ustad Yaseen that introduced me to him, him and Shaykh Saleh Al-Usaymi. So uh, one time I was sitting with the Shaykh and like, you know, the Shaykh, you know, is built very small and no one could notice him because he took his bisht off and he was just sitting amongst everyone else. And I noticed him, so I went to sit with him and I asked him for a couple of advices. One of the things that uh, I brought up was uh, the issue of Zamzam. And how I always see Sheikh Abdul Zaq al Bedar before his class, right? Before his class, he would go and drink Zamzam, right? And I, subhanAllah, it came up in the discussion. He goes, perhaps he does that so that Allah Azza wa Jal assists him in the lesson that he's delivering, right? And that really, really touched me. What I took from that is always seeking aid and assistance from Allah, right? No matter how smart and intelligent you think you are. Ibn Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi says, Man ishtahada wa sta'ana billah wa lazam al-istighfar. Right? Naam. A'taahu Allahu azza wa jal ma la yakhturu bibal. Or something along the lines of that. Whoever works hard and he seeks aid and assistance from Allah and he does a lot of istighfar. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Allah will give him that which the mind can't imagine. Right? We have to seek aid and assistance from Allah Azza wa in everything that we do. Whether it is da'wah, whether it is programs, lessons, you know, seeking knowledge. Allah will give you something that a mind can't imagine, guys. And I'm going to stop with there, inshallah ta'ala. There is kafara for it later on. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, a lot of you don't know that I didn't have to go through the way that translated documents that most of the people went from the UK. Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed me to study in Darul Hadith al Madaniya, that is about 10 15 minutes walk from the Haram al Nabawi. And from there, it was a straight route for me to be accepted in the Islamic University of Medina. And Alhamdulillah, graduated in 2012 uh, from the Kulliyat al Sharia. What I benefited from is mostly from my time that I had in Darul Hadith al Madini, especially year 10, 11, and 12, the Thanawiyya year. Those are the moments I cherish the most. Why? Because over there, there were nothing called Fusha the way that I have uh, seen in the Islamic University of Medina when I went and studied there. Because in order for you to understand the language, you also need to understand the Hijazi accent as well, because most of our uh, I, was, I was being brought up there. So when I understood that, anything in the university, in the Islamic University of Medina that I have studied, it became easy for me. But in Darul Hadith al Madaniya is where I found the diverse ethnicities in terms of teachers teaching us, alhamdulillah. Not only did we have uh, teachers from African continent, especially from Falata. We didn't find anyone from Fulani, by the way, just so you know. So Fallata, alhamdulillah, Sheikh Umar Fallata and his students, they taught us. And then, of course, Sheikh Muhammad al-Mukhtar al-Shanqiti, the one who passed away and the one who is alive, his son, alhamdulillah, their companionship as they also studied in Darul Hadith al madiniya when they were young. So their coming and going was pretty much the case with Darul Hadith al madiniya and uh, Al-Haram al-Nabawi. So we had teachers from Shanaqida background. Mauritanian background. Also, we had teachers from Punjab background, alhamdulillah. We had a, a teacher uh, from Guyan, Guyanese origin, British, alhamdulillah, who introduced us, uh, the, especially me, because there was a moment I lived in Bangladesh for five, six years. I even forgot the difference between Hamzat al-Wasal and Hamzat al-Qata'. So when I was told to write down something about few lines, as it was an interview process for me to get accepted in Dar al-Hadith al madaniyya I was writing, but always when it came to the uh, Hamzat al-Qata, I did not put Hamza on the top of Alif. So 
then I realized that there, these are the mistakes and the numbers were reduced. However, I got accepted, alhamdulillah. And since then, to tell you the truth, and uh, don't hate me for this, when it came to, uh, comes to the recitation of Al-Quran, I'm looking at the Mus'haf. For some reason, I don't feel comfortable reciting Al-Quran Al-Karim from Indo Park font. I despise it. Let me use this strong word. Indo Park font, I despise it for some reason because of this uh, incident that I had with my teacher in Dar al-Hadith al madaniyah Also, alhamdulillah, teachers from Punjab who taught us uh, al-Fara'id and also uh, a student of Sheikh Abu Bakr Jabir al-Jazari, rahmatullahi alayhi, who passed away in 2018. His student, Sheikh Madhub al-Hawari, failed me in usul al-Hadith, mustalah al-Hadith. Yet, alhamdulillah, two months down the line, I passed it uh, because I had to sit the exam or else I wouldn't have been able to move. And... Haramun Nabawi is where I had the best time, especially guiding people to the tafsir class of Sheikh Abu Bakr al-Jazairi. Uh, the Bedouins, when they would come from the northern part of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, as well as the eastern part, and taking them, dealing with the hujjaj as well. So these are the moments that I cherish the most, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah <laughs> khair. Wallahi, um, there's many things I could mention, um, but two things come to mind, two things come to mind. One is, is something that I would see a lot, and one would be like a specific instant, um, and it revolves around Sheikh and Sheikh Khalid and Sheikh Allah Hafadu. Um, I remember the Sheikh, Hafidullah, he would come in the morning and teach, his, he would teach in the Jami'a in the morning, and then he would come to the masjid on campus after Asr and he would teach from Asr to Maghrib and then he would teach from Maghrib to Isha and then he would teach from Isha for, uh, after Isha for another hour and he would do this every single week every single week and the thing I took from that was the sabr of the Sheikh when it came to Tadris you know um, when he would teach you would see he would get a bit tired but he would still carry on right uh, so I think about that Now when I'm teaching And sometimes I might teach for an hour An hour and a half, two hours And I might get a little bit tired I would remember that this, I, could, I would remember the sabr of the sheikh right, When it came to teaching And how he gave it uh, it's his all he, and, and the amount of patience he had The second situation was with the sheikh himself There was a time There was a, about a group of three of us We would go to the sheikh And we would uh, we would read to him his sharh on Madhumat uh, Sheikh bin Uthaymeen from Qawaid al Usul. So we would, he would make us memorize the points of the, يعني, his specific sharh uh, in terms of the taqsimat and the specific masail. And then we would come and we would read to him. And there was a time of a couple of the brothers made some mistakes. So he said, Lachis, he said, Lachis wahfad al talkhis. He said, Summarize uh, and memorize what you have summarized. So we came back the next week, and alhamdulillah, all of us got it right. And the Sheikh Hafidullah, he said, Inshallah, uh, or Yusma'u bikum yawman, inshallah, or yawman ma. He said something similar to that. Yusma'u bikum yawman, inshallah. And the, th the reason why this had an effect on me was, yeah, I'll come to it, inshallah. The reason, the reason why this had an effect on me because, was because of the personality of the Sheikh is that he doesn't talk much. If you come to sit and you study with him, you would find that he's not as warm as maybe some other mashaykh he would come across. Yeah, and he's 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 a, he's he's a yeah, he's sahib khuluq, right? He has good he's good well mannered, but it's you won't find him to be as warm as many of the other mashaykh. So what he said was, Inshallah, we will hear about you one day, right? What I took about took from that was that al ilm is ma kana fi sudur that which is in the hearts. Right. And I would see in the lesson of the Sheikh, he would be explaining a book and he would be mentioning things from the top of his head. Sometimes he would pause and he would look up as if he's searching, right? You know, looking for the files in his head. Where, what is that specific uh, jawab? What's the masala? What's the taqseem? What's the dalil? And he would mention it, right? Which shows the importance of memorizing and, some, and, uh, uh, and keeping that ilm within you. Having it within you and not just keeping it within the books that you have because the, the, the mushkila the problem you'd find in many tulab al nowadays they would come to the lesson they would take notes they would go home leave the book on the shelf they would come back to the uh, to the lesson the next week 
you ask them a question about what they studied last week, they won't be able to answer. Their ilm is what? It's in al-kutub. It's not in their sudur. When your, your ilm should be in your heart. Right? Uh, and this is, there's many other instances. Well, like even me and Sheikh Khalid. And, and there's so many. We, I could go on for, for a while. But I'll leave, I'll leave the rest for, for Sheikh Khalid. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, as you know, me and uh, Sheikh Mohammed, we're the only two British students who studied in Al Qasim. And Qasim was different from Al Medina in the fact that we didn't get to see ulama up close on a daily basis. But we would have days where we had durus with Sheikh Khalid al Mashaykh and things like that. So, one of the best memories I have of the Jami, apart from seeing the ulama that you guys have, hold, have heard, was interacting with the faculty of Sharia itself. And wallahi, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the faculty of Sharia and Al Qasim they push the students to want to become ulama and scholars. So even when he said that, even though I was not with him, when Sheikh Khalid said that to him that day, that was the kind of tashjid that the ulama gave us. They gave us and taught us, and I remember the dakatir would say in the jami'ah, antum insha'Allah ta'ala fil mustaqbal satakunun min al ulama, and things like that. You will be from the scholars in the future. So one thing I remember, the things that subhanAllah stick in my head, is reading the sharh that we did in Hanbali Fiqh Zad al Mustaqni' and in the jami'ah as well, knocking on Muhammad's door asking him what's the illa for this mas'ala, asking him what's the wajhul istidlal, going to his room, looking at what they're saying, looking at what this doctor said, then going to the library, then coming back, then doing muraja'ah when it's ikhtibarat. We used to go into the jama at night from, from Salat al-Asr and stay there till midnight and then we'll sneak and make sure the security guards don't see us. It was, wallahi, it was an amazing time. So interacting with ilm and seeing the names of these scholars in books and the fact that they wrote these books 500 years ago with no printers with nothing to save it. But then, you know, as one, you know, uh, one of the hukama said, ما تقوم وهم في الناس أحياؤ يعني that these people, they died generations ago, hundreds of years ago. لكنهم في الناس أحياؤ But they're still alive with us, as if they're alive with us, their words are still here. So interacting in the College of Sharia and, you know, being around, you know, our brother, you know, being around other tulab al-ilm and really challenging us, challenging our, our viewpoint. I remember there was a brother who studied with us who was mutaqaddim jiddan. He was a person who had authored books before he came to the kulliya. So we, we, when we would say, sahahu hadha al-imam, this imam said this hadith is sahih. He would say sahih. He said, is that the case? Are you true? And he would challenge every single thing he said. So when we would go to the dars, he would challenge, he would, he would challenge all of our viewpoints. And when the dars was finished, him and Muhammad would do muraja'ah in, in the car of the dars from Shaykh al mashaykh And I remember I thought like my head was going to explode. Yeah, and he's like, yeah, and it's too many masail. Okay, let's, let's just shut it down today now. Yeah, and khalas, Muhammad, you're not finished. Khalas. We did it from Isha, from, from Ba'd al-Asr to Isha. Come on, Muhammad, khalina na stariq shway. Let's just rest for a little bit. So, those things now, you look back at it with fond memories, and it was, mashallah, yani, wallahi sarahatan, the best days of my life. So, naam, that's, that's basically it. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair. And now it's nearly time for uh, Maghrib. Just one last quick question. It's directed more towards the start of Uthamia because he wanted to answer this question, inshallah. Any links with the, um, uh, with the conference? The title was Legends of the Ummah. But in reality, we were talking about the Salaf. You know, we didn't use that word. We wanted to appeal for, to the more... To generally, but the final question, inshallah, two minutes, no one to strict on this one because we got Adhan now. Uh, what is Salafi? If somebody attributes himself and he says he is Salafi, what is that? Uh, what is Salafism and so on? No. Bismillah. Honestly, this term, my brothers and my sisters, has been hijacked, it's been tarnished, it's been tainted. If you look closely at this term, Salaf, it means predecessor. And when you say Salaf al Salih, it means the righteous predecessors. Every single Muslim should be following the Quran, Sunnah. Upon whose understanding? My understanding? Your understanding? No. Sahaba tabi'een wa atba'u tabi'een. That's what it actually means. However, today when somebody asks, what are you? Are you a Salafi? Right? There's a hundred and one maybe things that comes to an individual's mind. Do you mean this type of Salafism? Do you mean that type? Right, and it's become more focused on labeling yourself that instead of actually what your actions being in line with that. Does that make sense? We should be more concerned in following the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the companions, the Tabi'een, wa Atba'u Tabi'een. Right? Am I saying that you can't call yourself that? No, I'm not saying that at all. In fact, Ibn Taymiyyah himself said, Well, Aib, there's no shame on someone that ascribes to that. Right? However, I think it's also very important to clarify a misconception that gets associated with it. And that is, 
anyone now who calls himself a Salafi, right, he's against Al Imam Abu Hanif or Imam Shafi or Imam Malik or Imam Ahmed or against the Madahib itself. No. These are great Imams that we love, right? And we say this without any taraddud, any hesitation, right? Following one of them when it comes to fiqh, is there really a problem with it? Absolutely not. Most of the brothers here, in fact, all of them, except maybe huh? one of them, <laughs> right? All of them, they follow the different madahib, right? They follow the different madahib, right? And this is what they studied in order to understand fiqh. While at the same time, when we study Islam, it is Quran, Sunnah upon whose understanding? The three golden generations. This is what he means, right? Sahaba, Tabi'een, wa Atba'u Tabi'een. Which is very different to a sectarian form of that. And Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin used to talk and warn against it. Turning this into partisan sectarianism, either my way or the highway, whoever agrees with me, then this, right, is what I'm going to maybe take in, and he's going to be with me, and I'm going to be with him. All of this needs to be avoided. You might be inside of your bedroom and never met anyone, but you say, I'm going to follow the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the companions, the Tabi'een, wa Atba'u Tabi'een. This individual, inshallah, is following that which is correct. Having said all of that, just because now you've embraced the da'wah, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a green card to enter into a Jannah. You still have to work hard, you still have to do acts of worship, you still have to get closer and closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. We worship Allah between hope and fear. Does that make sense? Hope and fear. Right, this is very, very important. Us being more concerned about our actions, being in line with that, and trying our utmost best. Right? And not putting other people down. Instead of just maybe worrying about what label am I carrying. If I've said anything wrong, the brothers here, Shaykh, they can correct me. Shaykh, sounds like you want to say something. Huh? Refute me, Shaykh. <laughs> Later, inshallah. Barakallah feekum. Alhamdulillah, with that we conclude the conference. I want to thank, uh, firstly, like I mentioned before, the elders of our community who, after the permission of Allah, allowed us to uh, you know, f they facilitated this masjid for us and went through all that effort. And then after that, I would like to thank all of the du'ad for taking their time out, come from far and benefiting us. And also all the volunteers, all the, the, the management, um, like Sharad, Zafar, Arshad, also media team, we have uh, Ahmed, Rayyan, and all of the brothers, volunteers on the brother's side and on the sister's side. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward, uh, reward all of them. Um, we do have another conference, inshallah, in, couple, in two weeks' time. So from the 2nd till the 4th of August, which is a Wednesday till Friday, we have a three-day conference with some scholars from Medina, Sheikh Muhammad al-Maliki, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh al-Harbi, and Sheikh uh, Abdul Salam al-Suhaymi, Hafizahum Allah. So they'll be coming, inshallah. It's a three-day intensive course, going through three different books. And then the day after, which is a Saturday, the 5th of August, we have a one-day conference with them. The posters are on the wall, as you can see, and they're on our social media as well. Also, if you scan those QR codes, it'll take you to all our social media. You can ask questions uh, on that QR code, give feedback as well. Likewise, as you can see, alhamdulillah, uh, it seems to be a very successful conference. And to help us facilitate more of these type of conferences, there is a donation link there as well that you can also donate to. Um, you see in the wudu area on the brother side, uh, we want to do the same for the sister side as well because they at, at the moment is quite small but that one of the next things that we want to do is expand their uh, wudu area. Likewise, it's, it's quite hot in here as well. So one of the next things that we, is that we're going to install ACs. So all of this you know, requires uh, the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firstly and then you know, your help with your um, donations. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to... Everyone make sure you come. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, make sure you come to the conference of the scholars, right? Everyone here is just tayammum. You guys know what tayammum is and water? If you have water, you can't do tayammum using soil. Benefit from the scholars, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakum Allah khair. Barakallah fikum. Um, also, we did put an announcement now that Ustav Rahman is going to be here. He cancelled last minute, um, so that's why he wasn't able to come here. Qadr Allah ma'asha fa'al. Inshallah, we'll get him again in the future. Um, with that, alhamdulillah, we've, uh, yeah, we've come to the conclusion of this um, Co uh, conference. If there was any mistakes from, from myself or from the masjid or from the uh, management, then please do uh, forgive us and make dua for us and inshallah give us some feedback and some advice so that we can improve uh, for next time. We're going to pray Maghrib now, um, inshallah. 
if we could just ask uh, the brothers in the front just to remain where you are because we're going to, I think, take all the tables into the next room, inshallah. So the azan will be done, and as soon as we've cleared all this, we're going to pray Salat al-Maghrib. Uh,